This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Paul Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tell us what the gospel is. How that Jesus Christ, that by our sins, according to Scripture, he was buried, he rose again, the third day, according to the Scripture. Thank God. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the broken heart, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, says liberty, them that are bruised. The word is nothing, if it's in your heart and in your mouth. Is a word of faith which I preach. You'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved with the heart and believe it under righteousness. With the mouth confession is made under salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And there's a power of God under salvation. Everyone that believes it, the Jew first, also to the Greek, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, a just shall live by his faith. I want to welcome everyone to this broadcast, receiving it on live stream, Roku, Apple TV, YouTube, other devices, co-hosts, Kathy Davis. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Always well. We have a very interesting program today. Yeah. One that most people have never heard about me. But before we do that, we have a, a lady that I've known for since 85. And God has brought her forth as a solo with my ministry. She sings songs that fit my life. Amen. And there she is, Jerry Brown, who am I? When I think of how he so far from glory came to dwell among the lowly such as I to suffer shame and such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place then I ask myself this question who am I? Who am I that the King would bleed and die for? Who am I that He would pray, not my will, thine Lord? The answer I I 
my battles until they're won for who am I? Who am I that the king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray not my I heard about a man named Barry Prince. It might have been 67 first, but certainly 70. And the people that I knew were just awed by Derek. The Davidsons happened to be, I thought, mostly English. I've learned since they've got considerable Scott in them, right? Right. The Millers were English, except for my grandmother, Minnie Bay. Oh, by German. My mother being half German. So I knew that I was perhaps a quarter German. More English than anything else. That might be true, huh? Might be, yeah. <laughs> the more we look, the stranger it gets. Uh, yeah, right. So, you know, I had been in the Navy, and I met British, and I met Australians, and I knew their language, and I suppose I was a bit cocky. I don't know. But when I heard how impressed everybody was with Derry. They'd been to Eaton College and wore tuxedos with tails to class. I wasn't impressed. Clothes Never impressed me that much. Amen. I like nice ones. And I wear nice ones. I was raised wearing nice clothes. And I met Derek June 1970. Chicago. I met Betty a few minutes later. I was really surprised after Derek left, moved away from me, I heard him say, Lydia, Betty's brother's here. Betty's brother. I'm Doyle Davidson. I'm not Betty Jackson's brother. Well, I am, but good Lord, 
I never been anywhere. And they say, oh, no, there's sisters here. Or we found Betty Jackson's brother. I thought, what is this? My Lord, I've been to Japan 27 months. I just didn't need to be identified by my sisters. So I got to know Derek a little better two or three days later in Tennessee. Derek Lydia. Lydia, a woman with faith. A humble woman. Very humble. I think several years older than Derek. I know. But I'm not going to say that better. I happen to be a person that likes people. I like people. So, Derek and Lydia were easy for me to like. That's 1970. In October, I was invited to Tennessee to whatever they call them, out in the woods. I was really a plainsman, a prairie man. I didn't mind the woods, but I liked the prairie a lot better. You could see a greater distance. So I went to that meeting, about 60 people there. And there, Derek, was casting out devils. He hadn't been doing that very long. I heard him say, I think it was a Presbyterian woman and her husband showed him about casting out devils. I think that's right. Said the Lord told them to teach Derek how to do it. You don't teach how to do it. If you believe the gospel, take the name of Jesus, they'll come out. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. As I learned, anyway, I was at that meeting and just standing around watching Derek pray for some person. He said, come over here and stand by me. I did. He said, uh, you're going to do what I'm doing. I said, okay. About what year was this? 1970, October. Okay. So, interesting. I had smoked several years. And I didn't like it, but I did. And after the meeting was over, I went to my room and all of a sudden, uh, a red, not more reddish, Orange, I would say. Something started coming out of my mouth. And I thought, what is this? I knew blood, and it wasn't blood. After all, 
I am a veterinarian that was hospital corpsman. Yes, maybe four years. So that went on for three more minutes. I had a, a mind set that God was delivered me from smoking. Amen. And not only that, I'm going to tell you, I thought he was healing my lungs. Amen. To where smoking could never affect my lungs. And that's what happened. I'm convinced of that. Amen. Amen. Like, I never smoked. Thank God. So, there was a man there, a beer distributor. And he was five inches shorter than his wife. And he asked Derek, by now I'm standing by Derek Prince, by now this guy walks up and says, I'd like to be as tall as my wife. I thought, mm -hmm. what kind of a party is this? I stood him back to back. And I'm sitting there in their praise, and this guy starts growing. Oh. I said, what kind of a deal is this? Can the devil do things like this? I had more confidence in the devil than I did God. The guy grew three inches. The next day, I know the Lord said, your heart's what stopped him, him growing to be equal to his wife. Listen, that scared me. Amen. That I could affect what God could do in a person's life You see, I had a lot more understanding of the Word of God and God than Derek Prince knew about. I left that meeting, Tennessee, and then the following June, 71, I went to Florida, managed a small animal hospital. For 11 months, there I got to know Derek and Lydia much better. Real well, right. And one day, I was praying, and God told me a woman had put a curse on me. I knew the woman. She told me, get rid of Patty, and you can have me and my money and all my social standing, and I'll take you with the jet centers. I said, no thanks. I didn't need a woman to exalt me. I don't dislike them, but my gosh, where I've been, no woman put me there. 
So I went to Derek and Lydia's house in Fort Lauderdale, and I said, God is telling me that I have a curse on me and that a woman put it there because I rejected her and God wants to deliver me. Well, Derek and Lydia both said, oh, the will, that, that can't be. I said, look, it can't be. It's what God is telling me. See, they didn't know. And what else did? God told me to sell 121. Hospital, hospital, and my practice. No money. They didn't know I could hear God. Amen. They didn't know I was called in 1958 University of Missouri campus. August 1, God said, I don't want you to be a veterinarian, but a minister of the gospel. You can read about that too. They didn't know any of this. They didn't know I could hear God when I was a kid. My dad did. I wasn't about to tell anybody. But the Lord comforted me many times as a Small boy, young lad. Amen. Might lead me out to a horse. And I'd talk to a horse. And that horse would turn his head to me. Hey, I couldn't get a horse, but I had a cat. You had a cat? I had a cat. Yeah, I know. And you had a dog, right? Yeah. Doghouse I'd sit on, talk to God. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I sat on this doghouse and talked to God. Nice, it wasn't. Yeah. You know, I never would like to admit this, but one day... I was talking to this horse. He put his nose right there. Horse's nose is soft. Yeah, it is. Well, why not bury your soul? Amen. So, Derek and Lydia kept insisting that I was wrong. I said, no, I'm sorry, folks, but uh, God has delivered me of this curse right now. And uh, thank you. I've got to go. I got up and walked to the door. And Derek followed me. I didn't ask him nothing. And Lydia said, Derek, there is something to this. Amen. And standing at that door, my Derek friends, God started delivering me from that curse. And you know what? That thing screamed out of me. Amen. Amen. After that, 
I knew all I needed was Jesus. Not a preacher. Loved them. But, so, in the spring, perhaps, I'm not sure when it was. Derek did a meeting in Orlando and he asked if I'd like to go assist him in the meeting. He said, if I can. So I took off Thursday, Friday, Saturday from the Met Hospital and they let me go. They were afraid I was going to walk off anyway. So I went and a woman came up had on a print dress and she was standing right in front of us. And all of a sudden in her abdomen belly wall out came something I I think it was as big as a grapefruit. It might have been slightly smaller. That thing bulged out, went down, and the lady said, It's gone. I said, what's gone? She said, I had a large tumor here. And God just took it out of me. You know what? God showed it to me first. Amen. You know what Derek said to me? I have never seen anything like this. I said, well, I wouldn't want you to think I have. We had, we had a woman here at Water of Life that had a tumor that big. Yeah. And and went to the doctors. They, they had all the um, x-rays of it. They scheduled her for surgery. And the night before, after coming to Water of Life, she said, God, if you don't do something, um, it was malignant. She said, I've got to go to surgery. She went in the next day, they took the x-rays before they started, and it was gone. Do you remember who that was? Yes, I do. You want to say it? That's Paula Small. Oh? Huh? Paula Small. Oh, my God. It was malignant. They knew it. They said, if you don't get something done with this, you're going to die. And the day before the surgery, she asked God, she said, if you don't heal me, I have to go under the knife. And when they went to check on her the next day, it was gone, totally gone. And it was the size of a grapefruit. You know, this is silly, but I removed 20 pound tumors out of the horse bellies. Amen. Thank God. Amen. That meeting. In Orlando, I don't recall anything else so remarkable. But Derek and Lydia, when they come to Dallas, Derek would always tell me or ask me, would you pick us up? People were upset at him because they'd pick me up. I'd pick him up. They didn't know what Derek was after. We were in a meeting in Dallas, not very big, not too many chairs. Uh, I think it was at North Park. Maybe a whole, anyway, a meeting room. And the meeting was over. And they start praying, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. 
There was a guy in there, six foot tall, cutter bound, hit the floor and spun. Kick chairs going everywhere. Now we got, Derek said later, no, I've never seen anything like this. That was God, you know that? Amen. Showing me. Amen. What he was doing with my life. Thank God. There wanted me to preach his sermons. I said, no. Take my sermons and preach them. No. I thought, if I'm going to preach, they're going to be mine. Amen. What God gives me. That's the whole thing right there. Right. I can't preach your sermons. Well, nobody can. Yeah. Thank God. That's what Derek Prince was after. He wanted me to preach his sermons. Well, he obviously recognized you had God with you. I'd say he did. Yeah. After I was delivered from that curse, he had let it both for somewhat awakened to my life, you know? Amen. What time? It is 1133. Thank God. Amen. Y'all talk? Sure. You ready for me? Sure. All right. I told Doyle this morning, I said, last night I, I went home and, and I was kind of um, oppressed. And I was walking on my treadmill and, and there's a certain situation in my life that I was upset over. And I started reading. I have my treadmill set so that I can walk and read at the same time. And I read, oh, not even a whole chapter. And then I was hot. I was hot. I said, you know what? I said, I'm not running away from this devil. I'm running right at you. Amen. I mean, my heart turned in just a little bit. And I said, not only that devil, not only am I running right after, right after you. I said, I'm running after you. I said, you and I are toe to toe. Amen. And I started speaking to it in the name of Jesus. Oh, it was fun. I love I love when you're just a little girl and you're only about 110 pounds and, and, you, and you can wrestle with the devil and know you're always going to win. That's fun. There's nobody else I could wrestle with when I was in school. We had wrestling in junior high and I was the smallest and I was the lightest and everybody beat me. I was the one they all wanted to wrestle because I was tiny. Well, devil can't, you know, devil can take 110 pounds and make it mighty. And last night, I went after that devil. I said, you and I are toe-to-toe -to -toe in the name of Jesus. You know what? That thing started backing off, and the situation changed. I bet. Now, I want to show you what's in you. What is in you? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I told you, my elementary teachers thought I was a little church mouse. It's Jesus in me. And if you know Jesus is in you, this is what's in you. If you will turn to Luke 9, I read this the other day, verse 51. And it came to pass... When the time was come that he should be delivered up, Jesus, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He had a job to do, and that job was given to him by God, and he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was going to get the job done. Amen. If you will turn with me to Isaiah 50, this is what's in you. While I'm reading this, I want you to understand this is what's in you if you are born again. Quit looking at your own personality. Look at what's in you. All right, Isaiah 50, verse 4. And the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. This is Jesus speaking. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. God had to teach Jesus why he was here. The Lord has opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious neither turned away back. That goes right along where Luke said he steadfastly set 
his face to go to Jerusalem. Amen. He is going to Jerusalem. And why is he going to Jerusalem? To do a job, to get you and I reconciled back to the Father. That was his job, to get us forgiven, to get us justified, to get us back to reconciliation with the Father. He had a job to do, and he set his face to go get it done. And right here it says, I had six, I give my back to the smiters. Amen. I give my back to the smiters. I want you to see that when Jesus went to the cross, he was not a victim of his circumstances. Amen. He rolled the circumstances. They, he said the power of God has come. But you know what? The power of God didn't rule him. Jesus uh. ruled all through the, the crucifixion. And we're going to see Amen. that here. He said, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore will I not be confounded. Therefore, therefore have I set my face like flint and I know I shall not be ashamed. He ruled when he went to the cross. Oh. The devil didn't rule him. Jesus ruled when he went to the cross. And I'll show you how he ruled. John 14, verse 28. This is what's in us if we believe, if we are born again. It says, verse 28 of, of uh, John 14. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Because I said, I go unto my father, for my father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you might believe. He's telling his disciples here, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and you're not going to like what's going to happen. He said, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and he has nothing in me. Nothing in me. I'm going steadfastly to Jerusalem, and the devil's got nothing in me. He said, but that the world may know I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. I have a commandment from my Father, and I am setting my face like flint to get it done. He says, arise, let us go hence. He walked into the gospel. He walked into the, uh, into the uh, what is it, the, the garden, the olive, the garden. He walked there. Why? Because he knew that's where they were going to come and get him. The man did not run from the gospel. He knew they were coming to get him, and he walked right into it. In fact, he said to the disciples, come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. Turn with me to Luke 22, verse, uh, verse 66. And as soon as it was day, they've got Jesus now. They have taken him. He walked into the garden knowing that's where they were coming to get him. Why? He steadfastly set his Amen. face to go to Jerusalem to Thank get God. you and I reconciled Thank back God. to the Father. He had a job. It was to save you and I. It was to get us reconciled, as Doyle was talking about Thank us. God. It was to get us justified. It was to shed his blood. It was to do what the Father wanted him to do. And why did the Father want him to do that? Because God so loved the world. Because God so loved you. He sent Jesus to do this. Now, 66, and as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together, led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. Here's an opportunity for Jesus to say, I didn't say that. Jesus ruled. Look what he says. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. This is Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin. They've got the authority to have him killed. So what's he say? If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor will you let me go. Does that sound like a man that's afraid of his situation? He basically told him, you're not going to let me go. I'm not going to let you let me go. Amen. I got a job to do. He said, hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. You know what? He just gave them reason to kill him. Amen. He just gave them the reason to kill him. They'd been looking for a reason. They couldn't find one. Nobody could lie good enough. They couldn't find somebody to lie good enough. So Jesus gave Amen. them the reason. Why? Because he had a job to do and he steadfastly set his face to get it done. And he said, then he said unto all, art thou the son of God? And he said unto them, you say that I am. 
Then they said, what need do we have further witnesses? We have heard him ourselves out of his own mouth. Jesus ruled in the situation. He was going to make sure they had a reason to send him to the cross. Now, go to, um, go to John 8, uh, 19, verse 6. Then the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him. This is Pilate, and now the chief priests. They cried out and said, Crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Pilate has him now. Pilate has him now. This is the man that has the authority to send him to the cross. Pilate has him. Here's an opportunity for Jesus to get out of this, but he doesn't. He said, Take you him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again to the judgment hall and talked to Jesus himself. Jesus, there bound, already been scourged. And then he said, Whence art thou? But Jesus wouldn't answer him. Thank Jesus God. wouldn't answer him. Jesus was not going to get out of this. It says he steadfastly set his face, and his head was like forehead like flint. He's getting himself to the cross. He has a job to do, and he rules in this situation. He is going to make sure that he is crucified. He is going to make sure they crucify him. Why? Because he had to get you reconciled back to the Father. Because he loves you, and he wanted you back to the Father. And the Father loved you, and he wanted you back. So he sends Jesus. Now, he said, then Pilate said he was the more afraid, and he went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Once art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Thank God. Then Pilate said, Speakest thou not unto me? He said, Knowest thou not I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? And what does Jesus say unto him? Does he beg for his life? No. He rules. Jesus never begged for his life. The devil did not have a rule over him. Jesus walked his way to the cross. And what's he say? Thou could have no power at all against me, except it were given to thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto you has the greater sin. What's Pilate say? From then thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate sought to release him. Pilate didn't want him to go to the cross, but Jesus was going. And he said, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Wherefore ever makest himself a king, speakest against Caesar. Pilate let him go to be crucified. Jesus got what he needed. He got himself crucified. Jesus got himself crucified. Jesus ruled in this whole situation. And one last verse. If you will turn with me to John 19, verse 28. This is Jesus on the cross. Jesus has been crucified. He has been scourged. He has been nailed to the tree. Every bone's out of joint. He is where he needs to be for our benefit. He did this for us. He didn't do it for himself. He had nothing to be ashamed of, but he went to the cross for us to get us justified, to get us forgiven, to get us healed, to get us prosperous, to get us back in reconciliation with the Father. And what happens in verse 28? After this, Jesus on the cross, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that he finishes the scripture, he fulfills the scripture, he sees there's something missing. This man's on the cross, marred more than any man, and he knows there's something missing. This is how he rules. And he said that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Now, therefore, was said a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, knowing now he's done everything he was supposed to do, everything the Father gave him to do, he ruled and saw that it got done. He said, it's finished. It's finished. I did everything the Father sent me to do. I did everything that was necessary to do to get these people reconciled. And then Jesus himself gave up his life. Nobody could take the life of Jesus. 
Jesus laid it down himself. Jesus is the one that laid down his life. The Roman soldiers couldn't kill him. The cross couldn't kill him. Every bone out of joint couldn't kill him. What killed him? He laid down his life. He ruled in every situation of that cross. Why? Because he needed you reconciled back to the Father. That's what the Father sent him to do. And that's what he did. He said, it's finished. Everything I needed to do is done. That's what's in us. That's what's in us. The one that can go through any circumstance and rule and rule. That's what's in us. That's what was in me last night when I turned and I said, devil, I'm not running away anymore. I'm coming right at you, right at you. I said, you and I are toe to toe. And I started going after him in the name of Jesus. It was Jesus in me doing it. And you know what? That thing backed off. It had to. That's what's in you. That's what you believe. About time you did it. That's right. And we have, it's 1147. 47? Yeah. Dirk Prince and I had a conversation once. He was frustrated because I wouldn't join with him. And he said to me, well, one thing's for certain. I'm your spiritual father. I never said a word, but in my heart, I thought, no way, Lyle Davidson is my spiritual father. Amen. 1870, James Madison Davidson came from Illinois to Jasper County, Missouri after the Civil War. He brought his children. Children were born there. Some. My grandfather. Luther Albert Davidson was born there. On that property. Lyle Luther, my dad, was born on some of the property that James Madison had put together with his family. And Doyle Davidson was born on a piece of 40 acres in 1932. That's three generations born Jasper County, Western Sarcoxy, less than two miles. Now, Derek Prince did not know that you had a dad when they said that you were going to die, said, oh, no, he's going to live. And he didn't know that, that you had a father that every time you'd get in a truck when you'd grown up, you know, Doyle, you're going to have to preach the gospel. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, God's done something in my heart about sarcox. Amen. How's that? Yeah. That's as far as I'll extend my mouth. <laughs> Amen. But then. It's 11.50. Father, in Jesus' name, open their eyes. Turn them from darkness to light. Turn them from the power of Satan to God. Minister forgiveness of their sins to them. Minister to them among the sanctified one by the faith of Jesus Christ the dead me. Father, in Jesus' name, open their eyes. 
Turn it from darkness to light. Turn it from the power of Satan to God. Master, forgiveness of their sins to them. Master, their narratives among the sanctified ones of the faith of Jesus Christ that's in me. God bless. See you next time. We invite you to visit Water of Life Church at 1621 18th Street in Plano, Texas. Or for further information, call area code 972-578-8082. That's 972-578-8082. Or write Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. That's Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas, 75086. This program was paid for by Water of Life Church.